I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by retired Captain Robert Salas, who served as the on-duty commander of an underground ICBM launch control facility assigned to Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana during a widely publicized UFO encounter in 1967. Bob is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy with military experience as a weapons controller, flying target drones, commanding ICBMs as a launch officer, and as an Air Force missile propulsion engineer on the Titan III program. Bob is the co-author of the popular book Faded Giant, along with James Klotz, and speaks regularly about his experiences at UFO conferences on radio and on television. So, Bob, welcome, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for your career of service as well, both in the military and in the federal government later on. Yeah, uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. You're, you're a gentleman. It's always <laughs> good to talk to you. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, I, I think a lot of my audience is familiar with your story, but for the uninitiated, and there are a lot of new people who are just starting to learn about all of this, your story starts back in 1967, as I understand mm -hmm. things, with an encounter where a UFO essentially shut down controls in your ICBM bunker, right? And what what's interesting is when I was reading about this, um, I had read that a similar encounter happened at another bunker only a few days earlier. Can you give us kind of a brief overview of what happened? Sure. Very briefly, uh, I was on duty at what we call Oscar Flight. Um, and it was on March 24th, 1967. Uh, we were in an underground bunker. It's a hardened site, uh, supposedly uh, able to withstand a nuclear blast upstairs that uh, we never we never tried that <laughs> but anyway uh my commander fred mywald and i were um, on duty we had six guards upstairs i was 60 feet underground locked in we couldn't uh, just open the this huge door we had uh, and go upstairs anytime uh, we were locked in for a good reason uh, security reasons uh Sometime in the evening, I get a call from my top side guard. He's very calmly telling me that he's seeing strange lights in the sky. Not only he, but his other uh, uh, guards up there. Uh, uh, these lights he described as moving at very rapidly, stopping on a dime, reversing course, making 90 degree turns. And he said it was the strangest thing. He's never seen anything like it. They uh, had no engine noise. And uh, uh, he said, they're not airplanes. They're just not airplanes, sir. And so I said, oh, wow. Uh, I didn't think too much of it. I just basically thanked him for the report. And it was an official report. It wasn't like he was trying to pull my leg or anything. Uh, so he hung up. I hung up. And uh, then he called back about five minutes later, and this time screaming into the phone. Uh, very frightened. I could tell how frightened he was. He, he had all the guards out with their weapons drawn. They were watching a, uh, what he called a, a pulsating red-orange light. And it was huge. It was uh, something like 40, 50 feet in diameter. And uh, I said, can you make out what's inside this light? And uh, it was hovering just above the, outside the front gate. Uh, he said it was really hard to see because of the brightness of the light, but uh, he could make out barely uh, some kind of a structured object, oval shaped inside this light. Um, wanted me to tell him what to do next. I was kind of shocked. I didn't quite know what to say, I'd, except that uh, make sure everything's secure uh, upstairs. Uh, you know, use whatever force you need to uh, protect the facility. Um, and then he hung up, said one of his guards got injured. Uh, at that point, uh, after he hung up, I, for some reason, looked over at my status board where I could see the status of my missiles. Um, and <laughs> I had this strange feeling something was going to happen uh, with this object uh, above us. Didn't know what it was. And uh, so I went over to 
with my commander. And just as I was trying to tell him about the phone calls, uh, uh, we get bells and whistles going off, uh, horns, <laughs> and we all knew what we we knew what that meant. It it, it meant the uh, missiles were were going from a, a ghost status to a no ghost status, or mm -hmm. operational to unlaunchable. So we looked over at the board, and within seconds, all of the missiles were down. Um, and so we went through our procedures. I called back upstairs because we had a. Uh, indicators at two of the sites where uh, a possible incursion had occurred in the launch facilities. That's where the missiles are actually located. That's about a mile, two, three miles away. Uh, we had the missiles located there at launch facilities. Again, protected sites, but we were able to detect uh, some sort of an incursion in those places. So, um, uh, called upstairs because we had two of those uh, lights lit uh, with uh, impossible incursions. So I had to send guards out there. I asked him about this light, and he said it just just took off high speed. Uh, so the object was there when the missiles went down. Uh, when the guards got up to the sites, uh, they saw the UFOs again. So we we brought them back. And again, they were very frightened of the whole thing. Um, uh, then when my commander called the command post in, at Great Falls, we were about 100 miles east of Great Falls. The base, Malmstrom Air Force Base, is just outside of Great Falls. But he reported this to the command post. And then when he hung up, he turned to me and said the same thing happened at another flight, another flight of 10 missiles. and I. I he didn't go into detail then, and uh, I thought he meant that evening, but it wasn't till later I realized the uh, same thing had happened uh, eight days earlier, and that's the Echo Flight incident that happened on March 16th, 1967, eight days earlier. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. Ah, well, so again, this is detailed, if I understand correctly, in the book Faded Giant, right? That's the yes. big one. But you've also written books. When I was doing some research here, uh, there's Unidentified, the UFO Phenomenon. And then you co-authored a number of books with figures like Stanton Friedman. And I wanted to touch on those for, for another reason. Uh, but no, it um, wasn't a, I'm sorry to interrupt. It. I didn't co-author with Stan. Stanton gave, uh, wrote the foreword. Oh, to okay. unidentify the UFO phenomenon, which I wrote in uh, 2011, 2013. Um, and then uh, now we're revising that. Uh, a large revision of that is, is going to be out in a new book called um, uh, UAPs and the Nuclear Puzzle. Yes, and, yes. And that, uh, I got Leslie Keene to write a forward for that book, but we've also included Stanton Friedman's forward. So, <laughs> yeah, that's the situation. That that new book will be out in November. However, if people want to pre-order, they can go to Amazon and pre-order it. Okay, and I will put links into that. And the reason I mentioned that was this has been an area of particular interest for me. Uh, UAPs and the nuclear puzzle. So that is this yours, right? And it touches on what Hector Elizondo has called the nuclear correlation. So this is something that seems to come up over and over again, and it has over a period of decades. This this correlation between nuclear assets and not not just military, but uh, you know everything from production facilities to, I mean, refining, purifying, you know. Uh, You've got medical nuclear facilities, right? Like hospital stuff that have had UFO reports. Um, mm. You have nuclear reactors, both here in the United States, as well as in France and other parts of Europe. Uh, it, so there, there definitely seems to be a correlation. And I think that, you know, awareness is kind of increasing about that. Um, do you have any thoughts on why that might be? Uh, yeah, I've got uh, definite thoughts. 
Um, let me just, uh, before I get into my thoughts about this, um, let me just point out that there was another incident in September of 1966 at Minot Air Force Base, and the primary witness there was David Shindele. Shindele is, I guess I pronounced it right. Uh, but he re relieved the crew uh, who told him that all when he relieved the crew, all 10 missiles were down, and they told him that UFOs were seen overhead uh, prior to the missiles going down. So within the span of six months, uh, 30, 30 UFO uh, uh, missiles were disabled by UFOs, three zero. Now, there have been, uh, in my uh, second book, I highlighted about 10 other incidents uh, where UFOs came over and either disrupted communications at the missile sites or uh, or just shone a light on uh, where the uh, nuclear weapons were stored and flew off. Uh, so there is very definitely a link between uh, UFOs and nuclear weapons. Uh, and those that I just mentioned, the 30, uh, have been well documented. Um, Mr. Shandeli has given his testimony to Arrow, as have I. Uh, these are official historical records now. Uh, there's no avoiding the fact that uh, Shindeli and I have uh, uh, given details to the Arrow Group, uh, Arrow Organization, and the U.S. government about the fact that uh, nuclear weapons have been disabled during UFO encounters. Yeah. I, I just wanted to make that point. Now, Back to your question. Uh, I kind of forgot what what was your question. <laughs> well, I was wondering what you think the correlation might come from, and and if I could jump oh, yeah. in with a bit of a a bit of an aside here. One of the things that's that's interesting to me. I just saw a reference to this actually in the disclosure project update, right? And that was earlier this month. I'm jumping around in my questions a little bit, but um, one of the speakers in Dr. Greer's presentation had talked about. Um, his claim, at least, right, unsubstantiated, was that uh, the U.S. government somehow tracks UAP uh, using neutrinos. And that caught my attention because one of the things that, that's that been interesting to me was how can UFOs find these nuclear materials, right? I mean, again, these, these are... It's it's I mean, we're talking about aircraft carriers, submarines, you know, production facilities. It's how can they identify them to find them? And one of the things that I realized was you can shield nuclear signatures and we do for simple safety reasons. But I don't believe you can shield neutrino emissions, which is a natural breakdown product of the nuclear process. And so when this individual said that we track them through neutrinos, I said, well, that's interesting because that was one of the ways that I thought that they might find our materials. And actually, since then, I've spoken with uh, Dr. Kevin Newth, who'd said that they were considering uh, the same thing. So, so it could be neutrinos. But I wanted to ask what your thoughts were on the correlation in general. Do you think that there's a reason or a cause that's involved with that? I do. I think the reason is uh, they want to caution us, warn us, discourage us from having nuclear weapons. Obviously, they are not weapons of war. They are weapons of mass destruction and not only destruction of our lives, our civilization, but um, practically every living thing on the planet. Uh, I think they've been visiting us for thousands of years, um, if not longer. And um, they probably consider this planet um, uh, a prize, a, uh, not a prize, but a, uh, a diamond, let's say, in the rough. Um, and uh, they want to see us protected. They want to see us um, 
evolved to the point where we can, I mean, we human civilization can um, control things that could destroy us and the planet uh, damage the planet. Uh, and so I, I think they're here, in my opinion, to help us. And this warning about nuclear weapons uh, is part of that process. Hmm. I don't think they want to interfere. People have asked me, would they stop a nuclear war? I doubt it. I don't know, of course. But I think what they want us to do is handle our own affairs to the point where we can evolve safely as a species. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think kind of what you're touching on is has been described as the zoo hypothesis, right? And mm -hmm. Star Trek fans might describe that with the prime directive, which is letting us handle our own affairs, but maybe mm -hmm. keeping an eye on things. So, um, so I want to jump into the current headlines. The 2023 National Defense Authorization Act, that was the one that went into effect at the beginning of this year. It included whistleblower provisions for UFO reporting by government employees and contractors. And mm -hmm. earlier this month, former intelligence official David Grush used those whistleblower provisions, provisions to come forward with claims that the U.S. government is in possession of crashed UFOs and apparently the bodies of pilots or occupants as well. Um, so again, this, for me, this was a mind blowing story and a mind blowing claim. Um, everything that I have seen indicates that David Grush is, he's the real deal. He worked, I believe at the national reconnaissance office and, uh, the national geospatial organization, the NGO as well. Um, he, has and then HIP, also a tip yeah and impeccable credentials and it, again from from also. what i understand several of his former colleagues have come forward and supported his credentials although not necessarily his story so one of those claims that's so big and so mind-blowing for me at least that it's it's almost impossible to believe and yet the credibility factor seems very high um, now, what are your thoughts on this story as it continues to unfold? Yeah, I, I too agree that he's a very credible individual. Uh, I made a mistake. He didn't work for ATIP. He, he worked for the, um, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, follow uh, the organization that preceded Arrow. I forgot the name of it. <laughs> but uh, I think the main benefit uh, since uh, Mr. Grush cannot present to the public uh, any direct evidence that uh, we have recovered craft or bodies, but the benefit that he is bringing to the table here is that he filed a formal complaint uh, that he was um, discouraged uh, to talk to anybody about this even though he had heard about these programs and he had the authority really to look into it. And the inspector general of DOD, I believe, has agreed that his case is, uh, I don't know the words they use, but is uh, in critical importance, something like that. Uh, and the IG now has the ball to investigate these claims. Uh, so this is progress. This is definitely progress. And now I understand that um, Senator Gillibrand and, and others want to uh, question him and in an open hearing setting, which is wonderful. Uh, we, we need, very much need an open hearing on this subject where the public can, in, in, in the in the whole, at least in the United States, and I'm sure it would be televised worldwide uh, in a public hearing uh, that this is real, the the phenomenon is real, and that indeed uh, we most likely have recovered craft and bodies. So, um, I think this is progress. It really is. Yeah, and again, completely 
mind blowing, right? I mean, I, I think all of us have heard claims and of course, you know, television and movies and the media have been filled with this for decades, but to have someone of this stature come forward is, is just mind blowing. Well, but let's, let's, I, I hate to, you know, <laughs> I, I'd like to bring up the fact that Jesse Marcel was a major in the U S air force and brought this whole subject forward with Stanton Friedman. Uh, Stanton Friedman was the first to interview him. And then his son uh, who saw uh, parts from the Roswell crash uh, became a highly respected uh, colonel in the Air Force uh, as he was a doctor, a medical doctor, a helicopter pilot, fought in Iraq, uh, in the Iraq war. I met him personally and he he drew the symbols for me that he saw on the that particularly part, part that was shown to him by his father. So I'm not trying to discount what Mr. Grushis said, but we have been there before. Uh, we have been told that we have recovered craft and bodies before. Uh, there has been over 300 witnesses to testify to the, the facts of the Roswell crashes. So, but they have been, um, let's say, uh, covered up quickly. <laughs> well, it, this goes right to my next question. Um, one of the things that's interesting to me about the Gru story is that he connects Elizondo's modern UFO narrative, right, which involves Tic Tacs and the naval encounters, F-18 Hornets, all of that, to a much larger 70-year history of UFO lore. I mean, this, this goes back to the 1940s, but um, the, I think that also raises a lot of issues. And one of those is, in Grusha's case, everything that he has said is secondhand information, right? And so then, then there's this issue of, is any of that mistaken? Um, is any of that misinterpreted? You know, was anyone literally just pulling his leg? And, and how would he know, I guess? Um, and then I think the, the other aspect of this is that his story also opens the door to a lot of mythology and conspiracy theories, not necessarily from him, but just that are out there in our culture. And these are currently impossible to verify. So what are your thoughts on this? Does it complicate the story? Does it, does it kind of throw a monkey wrench into things while still being good, I guess? No, I think it's all positive, uh, especially, like I said, if the Congress has the courage, I hope that's the right word, to uh, have open hearings. Uh, at some point, you have to challenge those individuals within our government, and I believe there are many that are holding these secrets, and uh, and somehow we have to challenge that at, because uh, uh, even though I, I admire Senator Gillibrand for writing these um, amendments to the NDAA, uh, uh, they are just words. Uh, and and uh, intel agencies know are very experienced at avoiding answering questions to Congress, including these so-called special access programs or SAPs. Um, uh, so uh, we have to have the courage to follow through on what Mr. Grush is saying. Uh, I believe him. Uh, in fact, uh, from my own experience, I'm convinced that we have a, a re-engineered craft and I know uh, we have recovered bodies. Um, so, uh, again, my point is we have to press the intel communities to cooperate. All right. We've got Aero now. Aero, one of the uh, requirements for Aero's uh, uh, to do is to ensure there's cooperation between agencies. That portion of my interview with Aero 
And this was after I gave my presentation and we were, they were asking a few questions and I answered them. And then they asked uh, if I had any questions and I said, yes, are you going to check with the Air Force on the validity of the statements that I've made about these missile shutdowns during UFO encounters, both the Echo and Oscar flight? Um, and the answer was, uh, not directly. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I can't understand why not, you know, why can't they go to the, uh, uh, chief of staff of the air force and ask these questions. All they have to do is check their, their records. Um, uh, they can check with AFOSI about the NDA that I signed and that should give some details too. Um, so I'm suspicious about giving Arrow uh, this much, let's say, responsibility. Uh, uh, but yet, um, Senator Gillibrand just issued a statement saying that um, she was proud of the fact that with this new uh, uh, revision to the NDAA for 2024, she made sure that there was enough uh, funding for Arrow to complete all its um, obligations, responsibilities. Well, one of those, I can almost quote it to you, but it talks about um, looking into validating, verifying incidents at nuclear weapons bases. That is specified specifically as um, a responsibility of Arrow. Uh, let me just read it to you. Remore, report on the number of reported incidents, descriptions of UAP associated with military nuclear assets, including strategic nuclear weapons, facilities, or assets associated with nuclear weapons and their components. So, uh, they almost admitted to me that they were having trouble doing that. Interesting. Well, I I want to come back to the 2024 NDAA that you mentioned in a moment, but I should mention, and this just broke, most people probably haven't even heard this yet. Two days ago, Senator Marco Rubio told mm -hmm. News Nation that he's heard several firsthand accounts from individuals in quote unquote, high positions in our government that support David Grush's controversial allegations. Um, so not only is Grush saying that we have crashed UFOs, we have bodies. I believe he's also talked about reverse engineering programs. Um, Senator Marco, Marco Rubio, who, as I recall, did run for president a few years ago, is saying that he is hearing the same thing, presumably from highly credible people. Otherwise, someone of his stature wouldn't be talking about it. So mm -hmm. to me, it reinforces there's a lot more to this picture there's a lot more to this story that's unfolding and it seems like a lot of that is happening this year and it, it, perhaps we could call that a success so far for the 2023 whistleblower provisions do you think that might be the case absolutely i think uh it's a success uh uh, we need more whistleblowers to come forward. Um, if uh, Mr. Grush, for example, um, when he's interviewed by the Senate Intel Committee, the House Intel Committee, uh, even if in a secret session, if he reveals names of individuals he's talked to, they can validate what he's talking about. Uh, this will go a long way to try uh, to penetrate this uh, shell of secrecy that we've had for over 70 years on this subject. And so I think this is progress if, like I say, uh, Congress, the Senate has the courage to follow through. Now, I, the reason I bring that up is because uh, <laughs> I've been talking to congressmen and senators for many years decades in fact uh first talked to uh senator feinstein 
in 2001 face to face and told her my story and uh and she nodded but didn't do anything about it and it's the same story that's been going on uh you know i've i i and others have presented our our nuclear weapons connection cases to the public since 2001 uh 2007 2000 and uh, nine and 2013 2010 and most recently in uh, uh 2021 at the national press club uh so uh where has the courage been for congress and senate to come forward uh why aren't they pressing for answers why haven't they been and will they in the future That's yeah still a question it, it almost reminds me of, uh, you know, it, it's like a diesel engine, right? It takes a while to get going, but once it starts, there's a lot there. And, and that's, that's the feeling that I kind of get. Well, let me, let me jump into the latest regulatory revisions to the 2024 NDAA. Um, mm -hmm. So again, 2024 National Defense Authorization Act, this uh, will require the military and defense contractors to notify aero of any crashed ufo material or reverse engineering projects within mm -hmm. 60 days of the bill passing mm -hmm. so next march probably february march could be very very interesting um so i know that this is a topic that you were very excited about you've already talked a little bit about it before the interview you had said this is something i want to discuss what do you think that we may expect to see from this? Well, it's certainly going to put pressure on individual uh, companies. Uh, I, I don't want to mention any particular companies, but you, you could probably think of some that could have been involved in uh, this re-engineering or back engineering of craft. Um, I mean, we've only got a few aviation companies that produce uh, hardware, right? Uh, but I, I think what's really important about this bill is it points to the fact that, <clears throat> excuse me, under secret programs like SAPS, uh, there has been funding. Money has passed uh, hands on, uh, uh, on technology that comes from possibly this possibly extraterrestrial this is the first time i've actually seen those words uh let me just read that part of this amendment um not later than 180 days after the date of enactment of this act make available to the director for assessment analysis and inspection a all such materials and b a comprehensive list of non-earth origin Okay, so you have 180, so maybe I was mistaken. I quoted 60 earlier. Uh, my viewers can probably look this up and yell at me well, later. Maybe it is 180. I just wanted yeah. to get that out there. Uh, well, not later than 60 days after the date of this enactment, notify the director of such possession of this kind of hardware. But the uh, point I was okay. trying to make... Um, uh, and they get, and after that, after they notify the director, he has 180 days to take actions, and then I think another 30 days to notify Congress. Okay, okay. But the point I was trying to make is the words "non-Earth origin." <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen that in a government statement uh, like this: "non-Earth origin." Yeah. Yeah, this, this, this is word. Yeah, I, I I would say my my thought would be whether or not you believe in UFOs, right? For the audience, um, whether or not you believe in UFOs, this is a watershed moment in terms of this topic. It it is being right. openly addressed. Um, you know, bills are being passed, language is being drafted, it is being worked on, 
at the highest levels in government and very openly. And but, Lord only knows what we'll see from it. Yeah, well, let me continue my thought though before I got distracted. When uh, the U.S. government contracts with a civilian contractor, let's say Lockheed, just as an example, uh, for any reason, those contracts are subject to review by the Inspector General of the Department of Defense. So what I'm saying to you is that if if let's say Lockheed were to admit that yes, they had been working on uh, this advanced technology, maybe even non-earthly technology, um, then they are subject to uh, audit by the Inspector General uh, for how they uh, expended those funds. So we can get down to the nitty gritty of you know what exactly they did why they did it, how much money it cost, because a lot of these saps have been um, highly classified, almost inaccessible, even to Congress. Um, the funding, where, where the money went and what it was used for, et cetera, are highly, highly classified items uh, that the Congress has been reluctant to really dig into. But now that it's been pointed out that those those uh, industries or companies that have been working on these uh, this advanced technology are now required to report it. Uh, that's a lot of pressure to put on them. Otherwise, they're going to be subject to uh, uh, liabilities. Well, I mentioned uh, Stephen Greer's disclosure project update a few moments ago, and I want to touch on that again because one of the things that he did discuss in depth was um, hiding this information from congressional oversight. And I, I know that there is a shell game that goes on here, but his claim was this is not legal. And he had also talked about stuff like uh, witness intimidation and a variety of other things that just simply aren't legal, right? Uh, you know, I mean, we're not even touching on the, the moral or ethical aspects of it. We're talking about the letter of the law states X, Y, and Z. And this stuff is basically finding a way around it to keep it out of oversight, to keep it out of public information. Now, if that's the case, right, and I, I'm just speculating based on what we may see in the next year, do you think that we're likely to also see prosecutions happen? Well, uh, I certainly agree with that aspect of what Mr. Greer said, that some of the things that are being done uh, by what I, I will call it, because I call it my book, <laughs> the UFO cabal. And that's just a term, a cabal just means secret group. Uh, uh, and I think there is a secret group of people working within probably mostly in intelligence agencies. <laughs> highly compartmentalized. And uh, I, uh, you know, they may have broken the law. Now, whether or not they'll be prosecuted uh, is another question, but um, I think that has gone on. But the, the problem I have with Mr. Greer's presentation, I don't have any problem with, uh, you know, him bringing witnesses forward and uh, even telling their stories. Uh, but the problem again is evidence. Uh, you know, what kind of evidence do we have to back up what he stated and his witnesses stated? Um, and, and that's the issue. However, since they identified themselves, uh, uh, now they can be called um, to testify again, either in closed or open session uh, in, in the Senate Intel or House Intel committees. And, uh, and, and state, you know, whatever things that they can claim and, and, and back up. Uh, so that's a plus. I, I hope that happens for their sake, because I know um, some of them seem very, very sincere and um, 
emotional about what they were disclosing. And I can understand that. Well, and you know, if it's okay, let me give you an example of what you're talking about in terms of evidence. So a, a longtime career defense contractor that I, I've been colleagues with and I trust implicitly, I've known the man for over 25 years and he's never lied to me. He had told me that he had been told about a piece of UFO wreckage. Now, the, the story that he was told by people that he also trusted implicitly mm -hmm was that this was, uh, I believe it was a, a chunk of material. Um, he had said that it was, I, I believe, about an inch thick with the spar coming out of it. They put this in a room and it naturally gravitated to the exact center of the room in three dimensions and just stayed there. And if anyone approached it in the room, right, wearing a bunny suit or anything like that, uh, apparently it would begin to move away from them as well. Now, what's interesting about that is, so this is a third hand story, right? And it's based on, I mean, the, their, the, the chain of custody for the story is based on trust. And, and I think one of the challenges there is um, it's not only trust, but it's also what potentially could have changed did he misquote anything did he misremember anything because he was told this decades ago and did the people who told this to him did they misquote anything or misremember anything and i think that's one of the challenges with this lack of evidence is you know these these stories they make it out but they continue to shift and change over time and you know, that's, that's part of the human condition, right? We're storytellers and, and things change. And so then it becomes this giant gray area of, you know, what reality really is and what we think it is. And that's one of the things that makes UFOs such a challenge is just not knowing what's real, I guess. But, but I do, I do think that we're starting to see some light shed on this and it will be very mm -hmm. interesting over the next year to see how much of the mythology that's out there is actually true and maybe we'll be able to also say mm -hmm. well what what isn't as well uh yeah i i certainly um understand what you're saying uh, there's some very phenomenal things that have been reported uh i could tell you many uh, uh, other stories <laughs> Um, equal uh, mystery, uh, but getting back to the um, this Senate bill or the uh, amendment to the 2024 NDAA, uh, one thing it does not uh, it basically says that uh, you know send everything or bring everything to Arrow. Uh, now, if you listen to Mr. Kirkpatrick, who's uh, head of Arrow, he had a five point or five step program for evaluating things that he received you know uh either as a report or uh, whatever and then but uh, he and he brings in other people to uh help him evaluate it but in the end he evaluate he, he makes the final decision uh as to what to do about it uh, he also says that he's really in the business of making Arrow obsolete. Uh, in other words, he wants to turn everything over to um, uh, another agency to um, follow up on whatever uh, in, mm, uh, thing he makes a judgment on. So um, uh, the problem I see here is that all, uh, all uh, this is being done for the purpose of informing the government, including the Congress, I, I admit, but uh, the Congress can be informed in secrecy, right? Uh, the Congress has the option of telling the public about it or not, depending on uh, security concerns. Yes. Uh, so the problem I see is here, we're, we the people, we the public, uh, especially people like myself who have been studying this for over 30 years, uh, researching it, talking about it. 
uh, are we going to get some answers here? Am I going to get uh, validation from the Air Force that uh, to the public that I'm, you know, absolutely right? I've told the truth, not only myself, but other witnesses that will come forward. Uh, or will the Air Force stay mute as they are today? To date, they have not said a word about my my presentation to uh, the uh, Arrow uh, or the presentation of David Shindelli uh, or others that can validate the UFO nukes connection. We haven't heard a word about that. Um, Mr. Kirkpatrick, on the other hand, has about 30 years of experience in intelligence agencies. So I'm sure he's got a lot of contacts with the highest of uh, intel agencies. Uh, now, will he cooperate? He, uh, he may cooperate with them, but will he cooperate and tell what he learns to the public? And I, I see that as a, an issue that the public needs to fight for and concern themselves with. Bob, on that note, let me thank you so much for your time today. And again, I want to thank you for your career of service, not only in the military, but also to the government as well, and for the efforts that you have put in to try and get your story out there and help shed light on this topic. Let me close by asking what you think that we'll see over the summer and into the fall as this UFO topic just rapidly builds steam in the media and new parts emerge? I think we will see a form of open hearings. Uh, they've been promised by now the House, um, I forget his, the chairman, but uh, it's the House Oversight Committee that uh, is tasked now to have open hearings and they've gotten approval supposedly. Uh, that will be a major, major event, like I said. Even, uh, I, I hope they have witnesses like myself. I haven't been invited yet. Uh, but even if they only have Mr. Grush and other people uh, that are on the, uh, let's say they don't have direct evidence or they can't present it, it'll still be a major step forward. Um, the other thing that I'm hopeful for is the um, effort being done, um, I don't know if you've heard of it, by uh, ICER uh, in, in, uh, in San Marino, the Republic of San Marino has agreed to um, make a presentation to members of the General Assembly of the United Nations to establish an office uh, focused on the UAP issue in San Marino. So uh, I think that'll happen later this year. And um, that will also be a major step forward. Uh, in addition, uh, I'm hopeful that other whistleblowers will come forward and, and tell their stories. Uh, so yes, I, I am hopeful that things will progress in the area of disclosure this year. Wonderful. Bob, thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Thank you, Tim. I enjoy being with you. Thank you.